Welcome back to Hello Nigeria. Now, today on the show, we have a very interesting guest because we're about to have a very important conversation, one that we think needs to be had over and over again. And more importantly, seeing as we're having tomorrow being the International Women's Day, what better way to celebrate this? One of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals is gender equality. And one of the ways in which we can achieve this is to start conversations that will totally kick out abuse. Now, our guest today is a face of, uh, she's a face of a relentless survivor of sexual violence. She's the founder and executive director of Life After Abuse Foundation, a foundation that highlights and commits itself to bringing the issues of abuse to the spotlight, to drive progressive conversations in order to galvanize society, to be moved to action in respect of support for the survivors. Thank you for joining us. Thank Halima you for having me. Thank you for having Welcome, me. Welcome, Halima. Thank you. So I, I'm very excited that we're having these conversations, Halima. Let's do a comparative analysis of, you know, discussing about sexual abuse. Now, I mean, I'm wearing orange, and I can easily think off the top of my head that orange is the color that we use when we are advocating against gender-based violence, when we're doing the 16 days of activism between the mm -hmm. 25th of November up until the 10th of December. We know these things now. Let's analyze what it was like back in the day and what it is now. How much progress have we made? How much more progress do we need to make? I think we've made a, a lot of progress. I mean, back in days, in my time, it was very hard to tell, come out to tell your story. I remember when I came out with my story on a popular blog, Linda Ikeji, I got a lot of bashing for telling my story from different people. But I think that over the years, we've progressed a lot. And because of the old women empowerment thing, when you stand to tell your story now, you are considered a very courageous person. But I think that to a very large extent, we've, we've been able to make a lot of progress regarding that. I hear you say your story. Would you mind sharing with us? Yeah, sure. Um, my experience of sexual abuse started when I was about six years old, and it went on up until I was about 11. And like every other survivor, I had my own share of struggles. I had, I had to suffer many years of pain, depression, and, and the likes. And it affected pretty much everything in my life. I saw myself as a failure because of my experience of sexual violence. And for many years, I blamed myself for everything that happened. And I lived my life based on um, my past hurts. Every decision I made was based on from a point of hurts, from a point of pain, pretty much. And I think that um, the breaking point for me was when I came to re the realization that it was never my fault, that everything that happened, happened, had already happened. And, you know, there was really nothing I could do about it. So I stopped, um, I stopped living my life based on my experience, my bad experiences. And I think that that was a breaking point for me. I forgive myself for everything I made myself go through. And I accepted my story. I came to terms with everything that happened. And I, I brought myself to live with it. And I started living life deliberately. I started, I made a decision to not be miserable. I made a decision to, I started seeing myself as, as, as an overcomer, as opposed to a victim. And my life took a new turn. Okay. All right. So maybe we should go back, still going back to your story. I find, mm -hmm. I find that a lot of the women who have come out to share their stories of abuse have either been abused by intimate partners or by relatives, it's just someone within their close circle. So who was your abuser? Was it someone within your close circle? Was it a stranger? And why were you not able to inform family? Or did you tell family? Uh, well, first off, it happened with six people. It happened with five men and one woman. It happened with uh, my school bus driver. It happened with a neighbor's relative. It happened with my cousin. So it happened with a whole bunch of people. And right from childhood, I've been used to keeping stuff to myself. I mean, they're just people like that. You just deal with things yourself. And I think that the first person I tried to open up to shut me up. She didn't believe me. And I just felt if she did not believe me, why should... And more so, my mom had been, you know, warning me against, you know, doing certain things like sitting on an elderly man's laps, you know, all those pep talks that our mothers usually just, you know, talk about. And so when it finally happened, I felt like I'd failed her. I'd felt, I felt like I was ashamed pretty much. So I think that that was one of the major reasons why I never really opened up to my mom or my dad. I'm sure she must have definitely overreacted. So, you know, that was just the major reason why I never spoke about it to anyone. 
So who was this first person that you opened up to? I would not like to put the person on the spot right now. So I just say. Oh, um, the, I don't want the name. I just want to know. Just like all yeah, it was said, a relative. It was, it a, was relative. a relative. Yeah. And so now, you had issues of feeling that maybe she couldn't believe you. Nobody else will. Mm -hmm. So, how did you deal with it exactly? Because yes, you said how you just had to go past it. But did you really solve the problem for you? Absolutely not. I mean, what happens when you hold things in? You suffer in silence. They are just things that come with all these things. And I really did suffer in silence. I mean, I remember at times I would try to wash my vagina in the bathroom. And he would be so painful from the abuse of the night before or the day before. And, you know, when I'm just done, I'll just wipe my tears and come out of the bathroom and act like everything was perfect. So nobody really knew what was going on. I mean, I remember at night, I would literally cry myself to sleep, and I would be on the same bed with my sister, and then she would still not know what was going on. So these are just, so um, there's really no way to deal with abuse. There's really no perfect way to deal with abuse. You just have to suffer the pain and the trauma from not opening up pretty now much. Now let's, let's look at, let's go back in time. Given the benefit mm -hmm. of hindsight, what are some of the things you wished could have been done differently by your parents, you know, by those around you to maybe protect you or encourage you to speak up more? Well, I would say that um, no parent has complete control over what happens um, to their child. My mom was a full housewife at the time, so she was very protective. My I dad, like that you mentioned that because yeah. oftentimes when mm -hmm. things like this happen, mm -hmm. they say, oh, it's because the parents are busy pursuing their career. My mom was very overprotective. She was very strict. I mean, we weren't even allowed to have conversation with boys. She was that strict and overprotective. And she did her best to give me the best life that any child could ever ask for. But a child has to go to school. A child has to play. A child mm -hmm. has to do several things. And no one person has control over that, not even your mother. I mean, she has her own life to live. She has times where she would have to go to the market. She has to balance being a good mother and being a wife. So in between those times, I think that that was where everything happened. And so no one person has control over anything that happens to a child. We just have to, you know, keep educating our children. And I mean, even sometimes with the old education and everything, because here's what happens with, um, perpetrators, they try to brainwash children and they try to win their trust and they, tr they try to I remember the first abuser, he used to give me like things at the time he would probably give me um, a wristwatch or, and funny, his grandma actually had an idea of what was going on but she never said anything mm -hmm. you know, I just kept hearing and this was a trusted family member that my mom, you know, entrusted us with and I remember telling I remember her telling I saw on once that Otuti de Belu Ele, you know, she said it in Europe and then she, she kept on you telling him, but she never opened up to my mom. She That's never sad. told my mom anything. And being the, the child that I am, who would not naturally open up to anyone, you know, it was just, she just never really knew about it. Uh, when so your I'm, parents, I'm just really curious about the point mm -hmm. where your parents heard your story for the first time. Was it on the blog? Yes, actually. <laughs> Okay. You know about that. Um, so I was, I was, I was um, on vacation once. I actually put my story into writing, and I showed a friend, and he was like, "Kalima, you know this is amazing. Why don't you publish this?" And I wrote it, and then I was on vacation once, and I showed it to my auntie. My auntie was a social worker, and then I just called my mom and everybody that I'm going to publish my book, and everybody was like, "What's going on? What's going on?" And I was miles away. And I just, I, I think that that was, it was there and then I opened up to my sisters and then I sent the book to my sister and then my mom called in. What, yeah, like you haven't even told me anything. Ma, publish, book, you know, just come back to Nigeria, just do this, just do that. And then my auntie also said, Halima, I think that it's important for you to have this conversation with your mom. You can't just go publishing a book without actually, I mean, there are repercussions. You might think that you are emotionally ready for this, but your family members are tied to, I mean, you carry a family name and your family members might not be emotionally ready for what is coming. So I just, um, I went back to Nigeria and I went for counseling at an NGO. And then they said, Alima, our society is not ready for this. It's not, they're not ready for, for this. So just try to share your story in 
small support groups, maybe in the church or, you know, just to build your confidence because this is big. You can't just come up with this. And, you know, it was... So um, I went back home and then I just took an excerpt from my book and then I drafted it out and then I showed my mom and it was just me and I in the room, very emotional. And then she started asking. So my book, I didn't mention anybody's name. It was just about the message because I knew that the attention was going to be on the abusers and it was going to divert, it was going to defeat the purpose of the book. So, so I didn't mention anybody's name. It was just about my story and how I was able to come out of it. And then she was like, who are those people? I mean, obviously she would overreact. She tried to get names from me. And then I told my mom, mom, it's really not about you know, these people, this happened years ago. And my my goal for, for this is just to be um, a, it's just to be, um, it's just to be a role model for someone, for a young girl like me, that she can actually, there's actually a beautiful life after and in spite of abuse, regardless of what society tells you. So that was just, you know, pretty much the direction I wanted to go. And she kept on asking for names. And then I just told her, mom, just rest on this. And she knows that. You cannot really get me to, you, I mean, you can't get words out of my mouth. I'm very strong-willed. And then she was like, okay, sure, no problem. And then I told her that I wanted to share my story in church. And I shared my story. I got a standing ovation. Even my pastor, like, the, the, the support was amazing. It was, mm. you know, I think that was what actually built my confidence. And then I started doing radio. Um, I started going on radio to share my story. And, you know, gradually, I just woke up one day and I had a foundation that was helping people. So that was pretty much Okay, so the abuse started at a very young age. Mm -hmm. Now, that age where you were when this started, and you now, if you were to do things differently, if you were to, you know, speak to a parent that likely has a girl child, and you want to tell them, these are the things you should do. Yes, we know you can't be a parent and be more like the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. basically. But we're like, th there are some things that you would look back now and feel like, maybe my parents should have, stood here or said this or taught me this because I personally I have survived more like conquered in cases of abuse already because of one thing self-confidence and a listening mother mm -hmm. I had the chance to tell my mom stuff and right before it could happen she could tell something was going to go wrong if nothing was done about it if it was to get a family member out of the house or make sure that somebody were trying to help with accommodation didn't have to mess me up. She would get, if it was to cut a tie or a relationship, she would do that. Some people can't. So what are those things you feel as a parent? What, whether be you a father or a mother, what are the things that you can put as guardrails to secure your girl child? And a boy child. We was not ignore yeah, the fact that boy boys child. are being abused I'm looking at as well. Case. Exactly. Yeah, so like I said, my parents did everything they could to give me the best life, to protect me as much as they could. So looking back now, I don't think that they failed at anything. I don't think that there was something that they must have done differently that would have made my life turn out differently. Like I said, they gave me the best life. I mean, I had a driver. I had, um, we had a school bus driver come to pick me up and then drop me off in school. And my dad would send the driver to pick me up from school. So I think that's all these things. And then we, we had to take Islam um, lessons you know, where you'd go to Lake I don't know if you are mm -hmm. familiar with it. And my dad actually got someone to come to Taurus at home. So I think that they actually, he put all these things in place to protect us. So I don't think that looking back, I don't think that there was anything that they would have done differently that would have made my life turn out differently, really. Mm. What happened. I would say, however, is that as a parent, I believe that um, you should be able to gain your, your child's trust. I mean, let your child be the first person to, your go-to person. Have that working relationship with your child in, in, in a way that, you know, whatever is happening. And then create time for your child. We have a lot of people out there who are so busy with work and they rarely have time for their children. And it's, it's important. And then when it happens, really, because it's always very traumatic, even more traumatic for the mothers, you know, for the parents, when they find out that a child has been sexually abused. So I think that first things first, you know, don't overreact because you don't want to try to scare the child. You want to gain the child. You want the child to tell you the full story. But, you know, a lot of mothers, you just always scare you get, I, I, I totally get what you're saying, though. <laughs> don't react. Keep your cool together in presence of mm -hmm. the child. Then go to your room and cry <laughs> your eyes out. 
-hmm. But we know that you launched a campaign, Men Can End Violence campaign. Tell us about it and how people can be a part of it. Okay, so Men Can End Violence campaign was birthed when we got to realize that, you know, women have been at the forefront of effecting change and driving these conversations when it comes to violence against women and girls. And violence is predominantly a man's issue. A study by the United States Ministry of Justice says that 98.9% .9 of rape perpetrators are actually men. And we have been leaving the active agents out of the conversation. When you see placards, what do you see? End rape. You don't see end rape. You don't see men should end rape. When you see um, end sexual assault, you don't see men should end sexual assault. And, you know, we, we unconsciously leave men behind. So um, we got to realize that the reason why there's a prevalence of violence is because we've been leaving men behind and we've been leaving them out of conversations and they're just in their very comfortable place, space. So we decided to take a pledge. We decided to get men to take a pledge, to pledge to protection and equal rights. So we designed a flyer and then we put their pictures and their names and we told them to say, I support protection and equal rights for all women and girls. And it was, the turnout was amazing. I mean, this went beyond Africa. We had different men from, from across Africa taking the pledge and calling other men to action. We even had men being accountable for their own toxic actions that they've done in the past to women and girls. And it was, it was just amazing. And everybody was asking it was an event. So we decided to, you know, just... Um, come up with a conference and yeah. organize a conference that's coming up on the 23rd of March. So you guys are invited. Thank oh. you. So how can people follow you for more information about this? Okay, you can follow us on um, at Life After Abuse Foundation on Instagram, at Life After Abuse Foundation on Facebook, and or you okay. could just yeah. So Life just, After Instagram, Life After Abuse on Instagram. Foundation. And Facebook, Life After Abuse Foundation on Instagram and Facebook. Yeah. Those are the accounts to follow if you want to be a part of this. I think everyone should be a part of this. Ending violence should not be a job done by the women. In fact, we're pushing for gender equality, talking about you know the fifth goal of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Mm -hmm. But this cannot be achieved by the women alone. It will be done by everyone together. Tomorrow is International Women's Day. I'm very excited about this celebration. And this is a fun way, you know, it's a good way to be a part of this celebration. To enjoy more of these our Ugonke videos when you just watch, press this button to subscribe on top of our YouTube page. You go love her.